On behalf of the entire Rhodes Technology and Society Forum, I am proud to uh, introduce Philip Shepard, a composer, producer, virtuoso cellist, and inventor who has worked with some of the biggest names in music, tech, sport, and film. Philip is the Chief Executive Officer of LifeScore, an award-winning music technology company. He's produced music for many global events, including the Beijing 2008 and London 2012 Olympic ceremonies, the COP21 Paris Climate Summit, the Rugby World Cup, the Tour de France Grand Depart, and the Dubai New Year ceremonies, as well as the scores for dance productions starring Sylvie Goyem and Akram Khan, theater scores for Juliette Bonichet, Cirque du Soleil, and Titre de Capucité. Alongside all of this, Philip has produced an incredible 65 soundtrack for film and video games. He writes with many bands, including Odessa, Uncle, Queens of the Stone Age, and his discography includes collaborations with David Bowie, Daniel Kubrick's estate, Scott Walker, and Alexander McQueen. Philip was awarded a place in the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, also known as the Oscars, a Webby, Webby Award for LifeScore's work with Twitch, and a fellowship of the Royal Academy of Music for lifetime services to the music industry. With this, it gives me great pleasure to invite Philip Shepard to the stage, who will now give a music performance related to today's topics of conversations. So I've got a question for you. Um, what if we could actually have music following us around, sound tracking our life in real time? It could make things feel more significant. It could kind of give them meaning in the moment. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, my cello doesn't play itself. Um, I'm cheating. I'm using a loop pedal, uh, which is doing it for me. And that's what I'm going to be using if I play any music today. Um, I love the idea, I've always loved the idea of music being able to happen in the moment. It always used to. And the reason I do what I do, really, is to see if we can make music weave around us in real time. As we've heard at the beginning of today, is it possible to actually use technology to augment the human experience and amplify what it is to be human, that kind of creative spark? And that's really what my, hopefully not death by PowerPoint talk is going to be about today. I'll let you be the judge of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by playing a relatively short piece of music, which hasn't actually been written, but it's a sort of set of different ideas that have been thrown together in different permutations at different time. And hopefully it's a good analog for the way that I see music. And I'll explain that a little bit more in detail straight after. And this piece came about from a drive I did through Montana, and I was going up to do a gig in a very posh venue, and I had no idea what I was going to play for my end piece. And this thing had just sort of formed itself from the rhythm of the road, and really the mountains and the place. It just felt like, I need to soundtrack this moment right now. Hence what I was just talking about. So this piece is called Buffalo Jump. Um, it's different every time I play it, because I'm sort of improvising, which means I don't bother really learning it. Um, and also, one of its virtues is it can be as short as your attention span. So this is Buffalo Jump. I hope you like it.
thanks. Um, so I played that piece in that concert, and a lady came up to me afterwards. She's very, very well-to-do, very posh. She was American, but I'm doing her as an English person, because I, <laughs> I might leash my Trump later. You'll be, you'll be worried. And she said, yes, uh, yes, interesting piece. I said, oh, thank you, She's rattling her jewelry. She said, I feel compelled to tell you. Said, Why did you call it Buffalo Jump? I said, well, as I was driving along the road, interesting story. Um, um, I'm Eddie Izzard. Uh, I saw a sign, and I, I sometimes do this, I just take something from the side of the road, and the sign said Buffalo Jump. She said, yes, that's what I needed to talk to you about, because Buffalo Jump is, um, is a strip joint. Anyway, <laughs> it's still called Buffalo Jump, and I don't care. So, what's music for? I think it's really for where words run out and where we need to say more than one thing at the same time, but especially being English, we just don't know how to do it, which is why it's particularly important at moments of crisis and great joy. And that's where I think there's glorious opportunities with technology and with old things too. Just a point of interest. This cello was in probably this area of London where it was made in 1750. Yeah, it's that old. And it's interesting to think about that will still be probably, hopefully in London, but definitely in existence in 250 years' time. Unlike, I'm afraid, any of us in the room, or my laptop. It's a peak technology, and I think there's something in that. We've heard this great phrase, the Maori phrase earlier, about walking back to go forward. I really want to dig into that a little bit, because I think it's terribly important. So music didn't always be sort of locked. It wasn't always locked down. It wasn't always linear. It's only when Thomas Edison came along and thought, we can make loads of money from this. I've just stolen this other person's invention, taken out lots of patents, going to get a monopoly. Sound familiar? Um, not naming any names. They'll come later. And he actually made it much more fixed, whereas music was always much more of something that you did collectively together. And we've heard that today as well. It wasn't necessarily performative. It also wasn't necessarily about making me the producer and you the consumer. It's actually about making everybody have that creative spark. Hopefully you'll see where I'm going with this. This really applies to everything where technology touches us. About, I mean, especially at the moment, when we're using technology to connect with one another, what actually is the opportunity there? How can we amplify the human? As Susan said right at the beginning of the day. I was walking in the woods one day, a while ago, working on the latest soundtrack, no idea what to write, so I normally go for a walk in those situations. And I realised I didn't have any idea what to listen to for inspiration, and yet I'm carrying in my pocket, I don't have it here because I'm on stage, a device that actually could in real time probably work out where I was, even how I'm feeling, and it should actually be able to create music in real time. And it reminded me of something that Paul Clay talked about, which was taking a line for a walk. This is one of his pedagogical sketchbooks. They're actually quite interesting. I don't read German. Translation is very, very good. I thought, what if we can actually create a triangulation between, if you like, place and sound and action, and make that feeling where the being present kind of comes together. And you can create this visceral reaction. It sometimes manifests itself as goosebumps, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's addictive, but you can't overdose on it. Surely, we should use technology for that. So, I did what anyone would do, and I started sketching. And I came up with an idea, which actually, the musicology I had been taught at music college, I didn't go to business school or university. I went to music college, more on that. Um, it made me realize that actually, if we thought about music more as if you like layers and blocks, if you could then break it down, still from organic materials, and then make it recomposable, there might be something in that. And I thought, well, it's a bit like having a Lego block. Uh, Legos for the American, and by the way, it's maths, not math. I know the S has moved over from one word to the other, but bear with it. And then what if each Lego block could actually have some sense of DNA and metadata, an idea of what its own composability was? And if you think about harmony and solo and beats and environments, all of those being these composable things, maybe we could create a technology with it. So I took out a patent. It's not this one. This is Lego's patent, uh, which is now not enforceable, by the way. It's just come out. Um, and then I built a team uh, who, I'm afraid, uh, they would love to be here. Chris Walsh, who's amazing, and Tom Gruber. Uh, I'm a great believer in surrounding yourself with better. We've heard that today. I think I'm a perfect example of that. 
Um, Chris founded things like Women of Winter. She's a recovering lawyer from Latham and Watkins. And Tom uh, was one of the three people who invented Siri. So he sort of knows a thing or two about AI, machine learning, and bits and pieces. And then Abbey Road got involved, and they incubated us. And we started recording little cells of music in earnest. And this is us doing that in Studio 3, where things like the dark side of the moon was recorded. And we were able to use all the microphones that were used on Sergeant Pepper's. And I realized this thing sort of got legs. I was running a startup by this point. Not something that was taught at the Royal Academy of Music, let me tell you. Steep learning curve. Then what we did with all these cells was we started to work out how can these things actually connect together. And where the machine learning and the AI comes in is actually in recognizing actually what these little fragments and bits are. You know, what, what harmony might go with what solo? And you realize that actually... Where, as a composer, I might write a piece of music that's, say, three minutes long, and that's it. But in a concert, I might want to take it for a different walk. If you do this with it, you've got six billion permutations or so, off the, not good at math, off the page. And then what you do is you then start to connect all of those connections to other connections, and you get nodes connecting to nodes, and it's probably what a musician's brain actually looks like to some extent. But you see, most Western music, before it is locked down and becomes linear, has all of this potential to it. All music does. Some cultures hold on to it, hold on to this composability. Um, a lot of Indian music, it depends actually on how people are feeling in the room and how the singer is. It, it depends on many things. And there's something beautiful about that. And it's still paying homage to a form that might have been handed down generation to generation. But adaptive music, which is what we're actually talking about here, is not new. In fact, it was invented by this chap. Anyone know who this is? Oh, dear. So this is Athanasia Kircher, who I think outsmarts da Vinci by a mile. Uh, genuinely, he's just one of those quantum thinkers. There's an entire encyclopedia of his inventions, which are so utterly insane, but a lot of them do work. He was just missing electricity, valves, silicon chips, basic stuff, born about 400 years too early. Let me show you. This is one of his inventions. This is, we can probably work it out for yourself. This is an expensive way to prank your guests. So you take a helical sort of spiral, and then you feed it up into the back of a statue, and then its mouth screams whatever's happening outside because it's been naturally amplified to anyone who's unsuspecting and passing by. And he rigged an entire hypothetical palace with these. You can see the physics, the way the sound waves bounce in figure three up there. Utterly incredible. That's just one page out of his book. But what's important for me about him is he invented musical computation. This genuinely is a machine from which you can compose limitless motets in any instrumentation to any syllable form for any occasion. And actually, when you build it, it looks like this. Still pre-electricity. We don't even have steam at this point, obviously. And then what's great, you've got these little panels that drop down into it, which are sort of number combinations of melodies and things. And then you have things which might dictate, for instance, the tone, the whole sort of mode. So the one upstairs, the one at the top there is a religious one, whereas the one below is vagabondus. That's not religious. That's the opposite religious. But these are all different modes that you can start to combinate and do permutations with. And you end up with these relativities like this. Look familiar? Unbelievably, my engineers had accidentally completely copied this, and I hadn't realized that this was sitting in the back of my head clearly. Now, we should be careful with Kirchhoff. He's also the man who invented the cat piano. <laughs> you think the Muppet phone is bad? When you press a key, a cat's tail is pulled, and they sing in tune. Moving on. Not very PC. So when you string it all together, you end up with something where you can say to someone, hey, how do you want to feel? Not what kind of music do you want to listen to? Or what are you doing? Oh, I'm trying to sleep. OK, we can probably put something together for that. Or I don't feel very good. My mental state feels a bit terminal. Oh, we can probably do something about that. Or I'm, I'm trying to get energized. I need to go for a run. Now, this isn't to replace the music that we all know and love. This is more when you turn to music for a function and you say, I need it. Sleep is a function. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's right there with food and shelter. You know, it's kind of 
it's, it's a human necessity and a right. And music is an amazing way of helping people with that mental well-being. We're in a tsunami of mental trouble at the moment. I mean, the statistics are frightening. We all know people who are struggling at the moment. One in three, certainly in the United States at the moment. So we put this into action, and our first client was a lovely company called Yoso. So now children can choose which dream they have when they go to sleep. Um, and this is lovely. It's actually outselling a, a company who, who might be better known as being represented by a mouse. I'm being very careful not to say who they are. And these cards, I don't believe in, I don't believe in childish music. Young children can take massive amounts of sophistication. So even on that card, the Dreams of the Ocean, that's members of David Byrne's band. It's the bass player from Pink Floyd. It's the Chamber Orchestra of London. And all of the environments that go with it are recorded by the, the, uh, an ambisonic recordist in, in real places. Um, we then went a little bit sillier. We uh, worked with Twitch, and we built a sentiment chat analysis bot, which could read the temperature of the conversation. There's a, I realize there's rather a timely one here, because someone is, is writing up here, um, Elon Musk. And then it's reacting by going, intense, oh my god. <laughs> um, and we knew this was a success, but this was actually scoring music in real time to a live TV show, 24 hours of it over a number of weeks. Um, they killed a character, the people watching, because you can vote on things that happen. So myself and the showrunner got online. We thought we need to invent new little cells, new themes for this character, for a new character need to be brought in to fill the gap. And we thought maybe, maybe ten, we can get 10 people online to help us write it. We did it as a little music workshop. Now, imagine, if you will, trying to arrange a contemporary music workshop. Um, this was 3 o'clock in the morning for me, by the way, because he's in LA. And anyway, I'm a musician. We're used to late nights and lots of coffee. And we thought a few people turn up. We had 18,000 people join in to write new music together. People like this stuff. They like being creative. And if we weren't doing it, other people should be doing it. And then the really ridiculous stuff that we started doing was where we could start to be able to triangulate data. We can then make cars compose. So we are doing this with um, Bentley. Hopefully, this might actually play with sound. So this is a car composing. What you're hearing is being composed by Bentley in real time. It's all real musicians. You get the idea. So Bentleys and Audis will be able to compose music for you in real time. And that's all little cells that record and then compose themselves in real time. There's no, there's no synthesized sounds in there. That's all real musicians. But it composes itself in lots of different ways. Um, so there's an elephant in the room, though. Uh, or is it a mastodon? Too soon. Um, which is generative AI. Now, generative AI with music, to my opinion, which is very prejudiced, sorry, Sounds like a fire in a pet shop. It is an appalling noise. And being a great believer in visual representation, I thought, well, I'm going to use some generative AI to create a fire in a pet shop, just to see if, if visual AI is slightly ahead. So I went online with Dali 2. I'm sure we all played with it. And being an American program, I had to translate fire in a pet shop into American, which is obviously dumps the fire in a pet store with domestic animals. Just really clear about that. Which it delivered a sheep and a cow on fire outside a Walgreens. <laughs> so we've all got some way to go with generative AI and art, I think. Anyway, it's made for a lovely Christmas card. So there we go. It made that too, genuinely. It's very exciting. Anyway, I just want to, just before I wrap up, talk about what the A is in AI. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's artificial, has no place in any of this. Uh, as I said, Elizabeth at the beginning said about amplifying what it is to be human. And if we represent the I in intelligence, who's that? Who's that? Shout it out. 
Thank you, Ada Lovelace. Only one person knows. There's a room named after her here. We should be having festivals about Ada Lovelace. This woman is an utter genius. I'm sure you all know this. She wrote in 1840. Nothing's new. Nothing, none of our ideas are new. She wrote, supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitched sounds, I'm sorry, David, in the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. That's astounding, astoundingly prescient. She'd not only, I mean, she helped Babbage build the build the difference engine, and, you know, it's quite extraordinary. And now, I was asking my most intelligent friend, who's Tom Gruber, I said, what's your view on this? And he's, his mission, literally last night from Hawaii, let's use AI to augment and amplify human creativity, not so much as a tool or instrument, but as a way to multiply from the precious human spark of creativity. And that's what I would love us all to be able to do with any form of AI. We've heard many people today talk about how it can be used for data collection for very nefarious, extremely wrong things. But there's an opportunity here to use it as a provocation, to use it as a source of delight. Dare I say it, to use it as an inspiration to lead us to goosebumps. And goosebumps are a good thing. It's kind of our job to create them, regardless of what field we're in. And I think my, if there's one thing I want to take away, you to take away from this, is how can we augment life in real time? Take everything, all those wonderful things, as I've said, all of those potential sources of inspiration and weave them together. Link them up one to another in all sorts of different ways in order to create things that are not monophonic, but are polyphonic, where lots of voices can be heard, and not voices that are all the same as oneself. I don't want to surround myself with white middle-aged sound. I've got enough of that. I'm sure you'll agree. So let's architect a piece. Um, I always have a very short attention span. This is the way I sometimes write music. Um, I like writing liquid music, music that can kind of pivot in real time. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece, Falling Water, um, which is the most stunning piece of architecture. And it wraps itself, it's a good mess for it. It wraps itself in using advanced technology from the time, into a natural environment and somehow elevates it and makes it even more beautiful than the original value that it was in. So I thought, just to finish off with, let's do some analog AI. Now, this talk has been massively missold. On Twitter, remember that? On Twitter, it was listed, I was going to use AI in real time to compose a piece of music. Well, I'm redefining what AI is. AI is augmented intelligence, and the augmentation is you. <sighs> So this is actually, what I've actually secretly been doing all day today is taking in, deciding what are the inputs going to be. And then the algorithm, where it is, somewhere in the room, is going to stitch these together into a piece of music that might be OK. So let me show you some bits of inspiration. I'm going to egotistically use one of my, well, it's not mine, it's Athanasius Kircher. Remember him, he's good. And this is one of his little strophe, which is one of his patterns. And I thought, oh, I like this one, 353. Three. Now, weirdly enough. If you're into following insulin business, that's the exact price of the stock, sadly. So I thought that we could translate that into music. 353, three. we could take ranges of a scale. We could actually use the 5 and the O as well. I'm going to be an AV person's nightmare here, and I'm going to talk and play at the same time. So 353, three, 5 O could be 353. Five O. Oh, let's put it up and I'll do it. it sounds much nicer than that stock price looks already. So that's, that's one bit which has been supplied to us by Twitter, which is probably one of the few good things to come out of it, uh, apart from our amazing first speaker today. Um, and then I thought, well, let's manage three levels down. <laughs> uh, we heard that today from Shafali. I don't know if she's still here. Um, and three levels down. That could mean, in my, in my perverse musical brain, that we're going to operate on three different levels. So we could do that as melody, harmony, and something else underneath. I don't know, it might be beats, might be a bass line, I'm not sure. Or, or the very, 
Yeah, so, so hopefully we'd have something in one range, something in another range, and something in a lower range. And then what's strange is that everything is connected. Remember those connected diagrams? You see, there's been a visual clue to this all day. Do you know where this came from? Just look, that's a graphic representing three levels down. No idea? Someone's been wearing it in plain sight all day. It was a clue. It's tragic this is how a musician's brain works, but there you go. It's great, I'm not writing this piece, it's writing it for itself. And then we've got, um, thank you Emma, for the, uh, there'll be a release form for this later on. Um, and then we also heard from, Fred was talking about things lasting, uh, the cathedral, I think it's Milan Cathedral, lasting, sort of taking 400 years to build. I love that idea that actually we, we don't, we, we're not necessarily entitled to see the result of what we create. In fact, we should build things that actually look after the people, generation, generation, generation. Climate change, we're not going to fix it within our lifetimes. No way. If we can fix it within five generations, great. That's a lovely way of thinking. That's, that's how these architects work. So I don't quite know how I'm going to fit that in. Maybe I'm going to make it slightly religious sounding. That's going to be, that's going to be my cop out there. And then some other things that were said today. This was said, actually, um, in the session that Vidal moderated, where I think Eleanor Brown said, the problem is it's, everything's monophonic, which is great, it's a musical term as well. One line, one voice. Music can be polyphonic and still make sense. Multiple layers, three levels down. Ooh, we've heard this somewhere else today. And then another nice thing was said, which is take human feedback and build it as you go. I think Ruman said that. Rather than doing this thing of just, you know, waiting, 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 making, making, and then release, actually release an experiment. And I love the idea that something can be kind of wrong, and then it can become right through its human interactions and through the way that people play with it and around it. I think that's a great thing. So now the pressure's on. Um, so if we, it's an easy title, so I thought we could, we could possibly call it amplify the human, uh, that sort of seems right. So the, the, the job now is I, I need to turn this into a piece of music. So we're going to be listening out for that little tone row, three levels of stuff, something cathedral-like, something hopefully that reflects the title, okay, and it's still going to have that stock price in, but hopefully be a monument of beauty. Now I'm going to be very Trumpy here. If this is good, yay me. If it's bad, it's your fault. <laughs> anyway, I'm very grateful for everybody listening. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you, David, for signing so eloquently and your whole team. Uh, and also thank you to, well, thank you to everybody, but I'd also like to thank the AV crew. This is the first conference I've ever been to where it hasn't, nothing's gone wrong, which is why you haven't noticed it. And as Tom Gruber famously heckled at Abbey Road when I was at a conference there, when everything went tits up, excuse my French, AI is easy. AV is very difficult, so thank you. <laughs> so this is the first and last performance of Amplify the Human. Thank you.